Well, amen, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Man, it is, it is always good to see all of your beautiful faces, and here we are, and we are well into uh, the new year, and I just want to ask how many of you have had a great year so far? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. How many have been tested so far? The enemy's come against you. I got double hands in the back. I got double hands over here. But you know what? We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. And God has been so faithful. And so we've been in a series and we're going to get right into it this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Malachi. It's an Old Testament book, Old Testament prophet Malachi. And we'll be looking at chapter 3 today. We started, uh, we kicked off last, um, last week, we kicked off our theme for the year. And uh, that theme is redeem the time. Redeem the time. And, you know, we, we all have just so much time that we, that we have allocated to us. And scripture tells us in Ephesians 5 that we've got to make the most of every opportunity that is put in front of us. That we can't uh, wait for time. It's not that you run out of time. You can't make up time. Time is uh, with you and, and, and you're in that moment and the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And so our job is to act out of obedience and wisdom and everything that uh, the Lord wants us to do. So redeeming the time. And time, truthfully, is what I would argue would be what we consider our, our greatest commodity, right? I mean, we, we, you know, especially as the older that you get, the more valuable time seems, doesn't it? And we begin to value every day and we begin to value every moment that we have. Uh, I, I, I know that's true even with my uh, family now as uh, I'm watching my daughters get older, and I've got one who's going to be a senior in high school, and, and that's my last year before she's off to college, and our whole world is going to change. Things are not going to be like they used to be, and, um, and so, we, so we're redeeming those times. We're redeeming the time that we have with her, and, and, um, and so, so God started off this year about redeeming what is our number one commodity. Today, the Lord has moved on my heart to talk to you about not only redeeming what we value as our commodity, but also what we value as our number one treasure. And the Lord has spoken, the Holy Spirit has spoken and prompted my heart to speak on the subject of our giving, of, our, of, of redeeming the tithe, of redeeming the tithe. And... Um, if you're, new to, if you're new to church, maybe this is your first time here. Maybe somebody invited you and they're sitting with you today and you're sitting there thinking, really, Pastor, the one Sunday that I get somebody to come and you're going to talk on giving? Come on, Pastor. And, um, but, but I, I want to tell you that there's, I, I, my, the reason that I'm speaking on this, number one, is because the Holy Spirit has moved on my heart to do so. Because here's the truth. We, the reality is that if we want God to move and operate fully in our life, we must, in everything that we do, submit to him. Amen? And, and so, in other words, you can't let God until you learn to let go. You can't let God until you learn to let go. You see, we can't operate in the fullness of God's blessings in our life and still hang on to the way things used to be or continue to do things in our understanding. But, but if we let go and we trust him, then God can move and flow in our life. It's kind of like if you're, if, if it's kind of like being in the shower, you can be inside of the shower and the water can be running, but you can still stand outside of the stream of that shower. And, and what, the, what the Lord is, is, is showing us is that he wants us to step into the flow of what he's doing. Because how many know that God's blessings, you know, we serve a gracious God, a giving God, a merciful God, a God who has good gifts for his children. But sometimes we, sometimes we are the ones that are standing outside of the flow of those blessings. And, and, and so that's, that's what this scripture is really about. So learning to let go so that you can let God. So last week we learned about redeeming the time. Today we're going to learn about redeeming the tide. So I want to read this passage of scripture to you in Malachi. And, uh, and as I'm reading this, I want you to listen to it as if 
on, on God's side of, of the table, for instance, if, and, and, and really try to hear the heart of God in this passage of Scripture. Matthew, I'm sorry, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. It reads this way. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. Praise God for that. Amen? How many is glad that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? He does not change. And so the descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are, you ro how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. That is a powerful promise from God. So let's pray, and then we'll get right to, the, to this sermon. Father, I thank you, Lord, Lord, for the privilege of relationship with you. I thank you, God, for the privilege, Lord, that I have to be able to preach this word today. I ask, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that the words that are spoken would fall on rich soil today. Lord, that you would, that we would just uh, be receptive to all that you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So what's happening here is this. You, there's, there's a prophet named Malachi. He, he's one of the prophets of the Old Testament prophets, and, and Malachi comes into town. Now, you got to understand, a, a prophet, they're still modern-day prophets, but prophets in the Old Testament uh, particularly were high-ranking managers of God's people. And when a prophet came to town, um, they usually, they, they came with a purpose, they, they went from town to town and the Lord would give them a word and they were to proclaim that word to a particular people group. And so Malachi, and, and the truth is, is nobody really wanted to hear what the prophet had to say. Because most of the time when the prophet came into town, he didn't have great news. It was usually in the form of a rebuke or in a warning that something bad was about to happen. And so... And so, the, and so Malachi comes into town and nobody really wants to listen to what he has to say, but he has a word from the Lord. I remember uh, one time, this goes, dates back quite a few years ago now, but I was in a church service where there was a modern day prophet and he was um, prof uh, prophetic, speaking prophetic words over people. And it was a relatively small group of people about the size of the group that's here today. And so we were uh, in this room in the sanctuary and he, they lined us up across the whole sanctuary, shoulder to shoulder. And, and this prophet began speaking uh, over each one of us. And, and so as he, as he got to the guy that was a couple down from me, uh, he says, he starts proclaiming about this guy, you know, you have this evil in your life and you have done this and you have done that. And he's like in the microphone and he's sharing all this guy's dirty laundry right there. And, and he's like, and uh, death is awaiting you. Uh, you know, if you don't turn from your evil ways, death is upon you. And I'm like, whoa, that is heavy. And so I stepped out of line. <laughs> I, want, I don't want anything to do with what this guy's got to say. And that's how it was in that day with, with the modern day prophets. And so... And so what was this terrible message? Well, Malachi 3, 7 says this. Here was the message. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Now, I, did you catch what Malachi says? He says that ever since... The, the, your ancestors long ago, you guys have been outside of my decrees. You have, been, you have been sinning. You've been doing the wrong thing. But he says, I want you to return to me. And what that is, is that's an invitation. God's saying, I want you to come and be in fellowship with me. And if you will, then I will return 
to you. So return to me and I will return to you. In other words, it's an invitation that's laced with a promise. And how many know that that is, that is awesome because, because God's saying, listen, if you will make the effort to return to me, then I will return to you. And so church, this is a scripture about redemption. And he's, see, see, we, we are in a season of redeeming the time, and that's what this scripture is about. It's not a rebuke. It is a scripture about redeeming us back to him. Last week, we learned that to redeem means to exchange for something better uh, or, to, or to rescue something from loss. And he's saying, he's saying turn away from what you've been doing and exchange it for something better. And, um, and, and, so, and so then he goes on in verse 8. And he said, and, and here's where a lot of, a lot of preachers want to kind of hang out on this scripture. You see, a lot of times when, when, when preachers, if they will preach on tithing at all, when they preach on tithing, they, they preach and they kind of rest right here in verse 8. And they say, well, will a, will a man rob God? You've been robbing God. They say it just like that. <laughs> You've been robbing God. And how are we robbing you in tithes and, and offerings? But see, I, I find it curious here that, that God, in this, in this prophetic word, God is far more concerned about, he is, he is far less concerned here about how he is being affected by their unfaithfulness. And he's far more concerned about how they are being affected by their unfaithfulness. He's far less concerned about how he's being affected. He's far more concerned about how they are being affected. Because he goes on in verse 9 and he says, you're under a curse. You're, you're, you're under a curse. Your, your whole nation is under a curse because you're robbing from me. Now, notice God did not say, I put you under a curse. Nor did he say, I'm going to keep you under a curse. He just said, you're under a curse. And, and so, so here's the caring message of God. He's saying that you're already under a curse and I don't want you to live that way. You have put yourself into a place of, of, uh, where you're not able to receive my blessing. It's like being in that shower where the water is streaming down and they're standing on the back of the shower and they're, and they're not receiving any of the, of the refreshing of the water. And so, and so he's, it's a caring message. And so God is saying, he's showing up on the scene and he's saying, hey, listen, I've got a redeeming word for you. If you'll return to me, then I promise I will return to you. And in verse 10, he says, I want you to redeem your tithe. That's the message. Watch verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Remember we said that redemption means to exchange something for something better. Well, here's the exchange right here in this verse. It says, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That's a great exchange, church. I mean, I'm no rocket scientist, but that sounds like a pretty good deal. Bring the whole tide to the storehouse and I'll open up all the resources of heaven to you. That's a pretty, pretty good deal. Now, to tithe literally means 10%. To, it means, it means one-tenth is actually what the true translation is, one-tenth. So what God is not asking for is a tip. <laughs> a lot of people want to tip God. They, they, you know, you know, God, you really blessed me this week. I mean, I, you know, I got the job and I... And I got the girl, and I got, you know, and I've, and I've, you know, I've had a good week. So, you know, here's a 20, God. Thanks a lot, you know. And we tip God. And, and God doesn't, he's not concerned about a tip. He doesn't want a tip. He said, bring the whole tithe. Bring the whole tithe. Now, I got to say, and I'm not passing judgment, but there are, there are uh, some really uh, well-known well churches uh, in, in the United States that, that, the way they receive tithes and offerings is at the conclusion of a service, they have uh, ushers that stand at the doors with offering plates or baskets. And on your way out, you drop it in on your, on your way out. I'm not saying that's wrong. 
But that's not how we do things here. And the reason why is because I believe that when you're talking about a, 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 a tithe and when you're talking about a decree of the Lord, that it is, it is truly an act of worship unto the Lord. And that's why we have it incorporated in our worship experience in the same way that we sing songs unto the Lord. Because the, the, the Bible says to, to sing and shout and clap your hands and make a joyful noise, all ye nations. It, it, it tells us to, to, uh, to strike up the drum and the lyre and the guitar and to, and to sing praise unto the Lord. And so we, these are acts of worship. And in the same way, when you give, you're giving as an act of worship, not at, out, of, out of an act of appreciation. You know, I don't, I don't want people to have the opportunity to, to make a decision on what they're going to give on the way out based upon how in tune Mike was. You know, oh, you know he, he, boy, he, he was kind of pitchy today. So, man, I'm taking that. And, and um, you know, Pastor, man, he was, I don't know. I don't know if he's just tired or what. And, you know, I came down for prayer and the prayer people had bad breath. And, I mean, you know, whatever. And, and so you're leaving. You're like, you know what? That today wasn't that great. Here's a dollar. And you leave, right? And because it's not about it's not about a tip and it's not about showing an appreciation. When you give, it is an act of worship out of obedience to the decrees of God. Because see, tithing was not a new concept, even in Malachi's day. Tithing, tithing was, uh, was something that dated back way before the Mosaic laws even. Tithing goes back 400 years prior to Moses receiving the, temp, the tablets from God way back in Abraham's day. And so we see tithing all throughout scripture. I'm not going to give you the, the biblical history lesson here today, but, it, but it, if you research it, it is everywhere from cover to cover we see that they gave one-tenth their first fruits. And, um, and so, and so the, we tie that of obedience because we worship God. The, the, concept, <clears throat> the concept needs to change. See, we live in a Western culture. We live in a, we live in a, a Western society that gauges success off of monetary gain. So the more you make, the more successful you are. And according to the world's standards. Well, that's not how we can think because then what we do is we, we, we look at tithing through that filter. And so we say, well, I went and I worked and I made my money and I put my money in my bank account and I'm giving one tenth of my money to God. That is not what it means to tithe. Tithing is not about you sacrificing one-tenth of your money unto God. The way that we should look at it is from a biblical and a kingdom perspective. And, and, and here's the perspective. You see, because I can show you, I don't have time, but I can show you all through Scripture. And maybe you know, if you're a student of the Scriptures, you know that the Bible says that it's God who gives us the ability to amass wealth. Amen? Amen. And the Bible also teaches us that it's God who blesses us with creativity. And it's God that blesses us with intelligence. And it's God who is the one who creates our network of friends and our network of business relationships. It's God who ordains our steps. It's the favor of God that opens up doors that no man can open and closes doors that no man can shut. You see, God is the one who's blessing you. God is the one who's got his hand over your life. It's God that is, that is directing you along your path. So that's why we give God glory in all things and in every situation. Whether we think it's good or we think it's bad, you might be in a real valley situation right now, but the Bible says still have a heart of thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. And to rejoice with exceeding great joy. Why? Because God may be leading you through the valley of the shadow of death, but guess what? He is with you and he, in, in, in his rod and his staff, they comfort you. And so, and so it's God who provides all those things. And so because of that, we need to understand that when we receive resources, and in this case, finances, that, that when God, God is entrusting you, so he's entrusting you to steward that money. And so the, so the Lord has provided you. So here's the way we should think. It's not about I have my job and I earn my money and put it in my bank account and I'm giving God one-tenth of what I earn. That's not, the, that's not how we should look at it. We should look at it as, wow, God has blessed me with some resource, and he said that I get to keep 90% of it. 
and the other 10%, I'm going to invest into his kingdom purposes. You see the difference in thinking there is that it's a, it's a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving for what God's put in our hands instead of a grumbling and a complaining, trying to figure out a workaround so that we don't have to sacrifice for the Lord. And so, and so why does God desire that we tithe? In verse 10, it says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Why? That there may be food in my house, that there may be food in my house. Now, listen, I began this sermon today and I began most sermons with this statement. How many of you are ready for some fresh bread from heaven? I say that a lot, right? And I, and I say it on purpose because we are feasting today. It's, this, is, this is spiritual food. This is, re, this is amazing what God has for us. And, and, and so, and so when, I, when I say that, now listen, can I, can I tell you that, that, every, that, that I'm, as I'm speaking of God's word, that that word is offered freely today. The word of God is offered to you freely, but the Bible says freely you have received, freely give. Amen? Salvation is offered free of charge. That, that, that your soul can be redeemed is a free act of grace that's placed upon you. And so, and so you know, but here's the reality. From the time that you drove in onto this property today, you it hasn't cost you anything you, we didn't listen i i know that i was late and coming out of second service so as a third service when you came in the parking lot was a mess right thank god for our parking team who knows how to park us into sardines and keep us keep us sane in this in this place amen can we give the parking team a, a, a just a big hand these guys have been amazing But you came in, we didn't pay, you didn't have to pay to park. We didn't charge you so that you park. You, when you came in and you grabbed the coffee off the coffee bar, we didn't charge you for the coffee. You know, we used to, um, a, year, a few years ago, we used to have a big spread of food. We would have fruit and we had yogurts and bagels and muffins and cookies and all kinds of stuff that was out uh, with, the, with the coffee. And people would come in and they would have a, they would have a plate, a mat, like Thanksgiving dinner. They would have a plate full, a mound of food. And they would sit in service. I'm serious. They used to crack me up. They would sit in service. And I'm preaching. And you would think it was like a movie, like a big pot, bucket of popcorn. They're like. <laughs> and some, and they'd be like, hey, you want some? You know, passing it around like it's a feast. And, and some people, they would finish. And they would get up in my sermon and go out and get another plate full of food. I'm like, man, it's supposed to be like a, like a little sweet with your coffee. That's it. But okay, you know, whatever. You're starving. We're supposed to feed the hungry. So praise the Lord. But, but we don't, you don't pay for, for any of that. You don't pay for the coffee. And, and when you walk in, uh, everything is taken care of. I mean, uh, we, you know, the, the heat is on. The lights are on. The, we've, got, we've got equipment and sound equipment and instruments and things so that we can enjoy the worship experience. And all of that is taking place. And it hasn't cost a single penny for that day. You, you, you go downstairs. We have programs. We have, you know, we have all these programs that we offer. Every program in this church takes money. It, it requires just the law. I mean, it's, 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 what, it's, it's just the laws of life. It just takes finances to be able to move these things forward and the truth is is if i if i made our children's ministries and our youth ministries uh which i believe are among the most the, the most critical ministries in the church that we have got to resource and we've got to take care of our kids if i was to mandate that that uh that they raise all of their own money in order before they ever do anything then guess what they would cease to exist because they couldn't do it that they just couldn't do it. I mean, our youth do a lot of fundraisers and stuff because they have a lot of extracurricular activity, but they don't come close to meeting their budget every year. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, Pastor JC is not in here, but I'm, I'm meeting with him tomorrow to go over last year's numbers and how much he raised and how much we spent on the youth department. And uh, he's going to fall out of his chair. But you know what? It's to the glory of God because I will tell you this, on, on uh, Tuesday night when they're here on, in youth group, these students are gathering around each other, 40, 50, and sometimes 60 students laying hands on each other, praying, speaking in tongues, trusting God for greater things in their life, starting Bible studies in their school, changing their world for Jesus Christ. Amen. That's money well spent. That's money well spent. 
And so, and so in many cases, if I, if I was to nickel and dime for every single thing that we do, Royal Rangers, Missionettes, Men's Group, Women's Group, Jubilee, Prayer Teams, Ministries, Ushers, Tech Teams, the Parking Life, I mean, everybody, every program, we're, we're having an Ushers meeting next, next week after church. It's going to take a lunch. Where do you think that lunch is coming from? I mean, it doesn't come out of thin air. There's, there's finance. Everybody, every, you know, we're the eatingest church I've ever been to in my life. We, we, I'm telling you, every ministry is like, well, we got to do it around a meal because, you know, we, but okay, whatever it takes. But see, but see, listen, there's what God's saying. God's saying, be faithful with what I, with what I give you. If you're faithful with what I give you, then there will be food in my house. And he's not talking about He's not talking always about literal food. He's talking about the spiritual nourishment that comes. This is why in, in the book of Acts, the Bible teaches about uh, when the apostle would come into town, that men and women would lay their possessions at the apostle's feet so that he would be in need of nothing. In other words, the reason that they did that was so that he could be about the Lord's business. If we spend all of our time trying to raise funds all the time and not contributing and tithing to the church, then guess what? We would become a fundraising organization. We would spend 95% of our time raising money just so that we could keep the lights on and keep the doors open. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to be light in this world. We are called to be his ambassadors to share the gospel message to those who are in need. Amen? Amen. So then God says something very peculiar after this. He says... Test me in this. Test me in this. Now, the reason this is peculiar, maybe you're a student of the word and maybe you're reading the Bible through this year. I don't know if you're through into De Deuteronomy yet. But the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 says this. God is very clear. Do not test the Lord thy God. <laughs> very clear. With an exclamation point, underlined it, bolded, and italicized. Do not test the Lord thy God. The wording there is so emphatic. He was very serious. And, he, you know, uh, it's, he's, he's like, I'm God and what I say goes. And it reminds me yesterday, my son, my son Russell is playing basketball now. And, uh, and he's in the fourth grade. And um, we were at his game yesterday. He made his first basket, by the way. Hallelujah. He's <laughs> a proud dad. And um, <clears throat> so... So he, he's at his game, and the ref is like this this <laughs> grumpy guy. But he but he uh, one of the one of the kids on the other team decided that he wa he didn't like the foul that was called, and he shouldn't have liked the foul because it was the, he called him out, and he was like in the middle of the court. So I don't think the guy could see too well. But anyway, the the, the student was right; he was correct. But the ref yelled at him, and he says, "I make the calls; you play the game." In other words, he's saying, don't you call me to task. I'm the ref. I'm in charge here. I will kick you out of this game, you and your fourth grade tail. It'll be right out of here, you know? And, and in some ways, God is saying here in Deuteronomy, he's saying, do not test the Lord thy God. It's such a, it's such a fanatic, um, such a radical message that Jesus references it when Jesus is being tempted by Satan in Matthew uh, chapter 4, and he's being tempted in the wilderness, and, and, and Satan comes at him with scripture, but he takes it out of text, and then Jesus rises up and he says, yes, but it's also said, do not put the Lord thy God to the test. See, Jesus referenced this very scripture. So, so we know that God does not tolerate being tested. But essentially what's happening here is that he is saying, listen, don't you dare put me to the test. But as it relates to tithing, you can test me. That is, that is a radical revelation, church. That is, that is awesome. He's saying, don't you dare test me except in this. So, so he's encouraging them uh, to test him for a reason. What's the reason? The reason was he was so concerned about their relationship. God, do you realize that from the beginning of time, God has wanted relationship with his children. From, from the beginning of creation with Adam and Eve. Remember in the book of Genesis, it says that, that God walked with Adam 
that they walked together in the garden. They fellowshiped together. He enjoyed being with Adam. He enjoyed just talking with him, being with Eve, just hanging out. But then when sin entered, it separated them. And from Genesis 3 all the way until the end of Scripture, God has been trying to make provision and make a way for man to, for creation to have relationship with their creator once again. And that's what he said. If you will come back to me, I will come to you. If you will come back, I will come to you. If it's an invitation and it's attached to a promise, there's redemption available. It's been, it's been his heart cry all this time. And so once again, they are, they have cut themselves off from a windfall of blessing because they have backed themselves up into a curse and their hearts have grown cold and their fists have clenched to all that they have had because they live in fear of losing everything they have. And God says, test me, because if you will, I will open up the opportunity for me to show you just what I have in store for you. Now, check this out. Verse 11 is when the doors come off of this scripture and the doors come off of this prophecy. It says this. He says, if See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. He says, test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. God is saying, "Woo! I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. In fact, he's so emphatic about it that he puts his name to that promise, not once, not twice, but three times from chapter verses 10 through the end of the, through verse 12. He says, says the Lord Almighty, says the Lord Almighty, says the Lord Almighty, test me in this because when you do, whoo, do I have a promise awaiting you? The windfall of my blessing will come all over you. Now, now I, I have to ask you, is that a happy message or is that a negative message? Happy. That is a happy message. That is a message of promise. It's a message of redemption. It's a message of relationship. It's a message of care. It's a message of concern. It's a message of God's grace. And so, see, we, we get, we get happy. It's, it's a happy reality. Then, then why, if this is such a happy reality, then why do so many people get twisted and upset when a pastor starts talking about giving? And, you know, I have to tell you, years ago when I became the pastor of this church and the first time I talked on giving, which, by the way, I love to talk about giving. I, I do. I don't preach on it often, but I love to preach on it. And the reason I love to is because I'm leading a church and I want to lead a church into the fullness of his blessings. I know what it is to walk in that fullness. And, and listen, I, 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 I wish I had the time. I could tell you times when it did not make sense for me uh, on a practical level to tithe because I couldn't, I literally could not put diapers on my kids and put food on their mouth, literally. But I was taught when I was a young boy and I was in church and my pastor, Greg Whitlow, he taught us the importance of the tithe and why we should tithe. And I got that when I was a kid. And so I just have never, ever strayed from that from that uh, decree of God. And, and I will tell you, I tithe today. My tithe goes straight to the district office. That's, that's my agreement as an ordained minister with the assemblies. That's what we do. So every pastor goes to, but you know, it doesn't stay in the local church. It goes to our, our district, which is my covering. And I'm okay with that. But, but, um, but it's my first fruit. I mean, I, it's the first thing that comes. I get the check and boom, the first thing that goes out the door is straight to pay my tithe. And so I, so I get this, and, and I, want, I want our whole church to understand and to, and to walk in that blessing because it's not a burden for me. I don't ever look at it. It's just I look at it like I said before. God has given me, uh, he's, he's entrusted something into my hands, and, and I get to keep 90% of it, and the 10% he just wants me to invest back into his kingdom. And so, and so when we have that mindset, it, it changes our perspective. And so when I preached on tithing for the first time here as the, as the new pastor, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in my office. I was downstairs at the time, and he, and he said to me, he said, Chris, when you preach on giving, I don't, I don't want you to preach out of desperation because you're barely making it. 
I don't want you to preach out of desperation because you're barely making it. He said, I want you making it so when you preach on giving, you will preach out of a desperation for more of me. And I never forgot that, that God wants us to just be so desperate for him that it really doesn't matter. It's because, can I tell you something? Tithing is not about the money. It's not about the dollars. And, and when, we can get, when we can get past that, it, it opens us up to the goodness and the mercies of God. Amen. You see, just like the Israelites, the people, they, they took the wrong approach to monetary gain. And they believed that they were doing right. But actually, their lack of understanding of God's principles had led them into a dark and selfish center. And now they, were, they walked themselves into a curse and they didn't even know it. You know, I, I, I preached to you about three weeks ago. Uh, I think it was three weeks ago, New Year's, New Year's Eve. And in that sermon, I, talked, I shared an illustration about how, um, about how back in the 20s and 30s, uh, that that um, doctors were prescribing cigarettes for for people suffering with stress and anxiety, and so they so they were prescribing cigarettes, and so men and women and young young people. My my father was one of them who, from a very very young age, had a prescription from a doctor to start smoking, and so they start smoking to kind of calm their nerves and anxiety, and as a result, without even knowing it, as they're puffing away for for ten and twenty and thirty and forty years suddenly they're backing themselves up into a curse and they don't even know it. And that curse of emphysema, my, my grandfather died of emphysema, uh, the curse of emphysema, the curse of, of cancers of all, of all kinds, the curse that, uh, of, of health that, that, that just deteriorates because of, what, because of the effects of what smoking does to you. But see, if you tell somebody who, who walked into that curse, and here's, here's the parallel, you tell somebody that walks into one of those curses blindly, they don't realize it, and, and, and they've been smoking for 35 years, and you say, well, smoking will kill you, and they say, yeah, I know that, but don't you dare try to take my cigarettes away right and 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 that's how and that's how we are sometimes with our finance you come to church and and the pastor says well you know we're supposed to tithe and and you say well you know I might have backed myself up into a curse but don't you dare try to take my money away can, can, can I tell you I'm not trying to take your money God doesn't need your money like like God needs us to pay his rent right God does not need us. He did, he, listen, I serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible says that, that all the riches are his. All the gold is his. All the silver is his. That's the Bible. It's what it says. He owns the sun, moon, stars. He owns it all. Amen. He does not need our money. Amen. So there's some, there's, some, there's some approaches to giving, some, some, some false approaches, a couple of them. I just want to share with you quickly, and then we're going to pray. And one is this. A lot of times our approach is, I've got to give. I have to. Not like I have to, I'm desperate to. Like I have to, like the, God's making me. I have to give because if I don't, God won't. If I, if I don't, then God won't. If I don't deliver, God won't deliver. If I don't give, then they won't be able to fix the church. If I don't give, they can't make capital improvements. How many like the capital improvement that's happening out there on the front? Isn't that cool? We're going to close that in, give us some more space out there so that we can fellowship together. And, and uh, I'm so excited about, about that. Um, if I don't, God won't. If I don't give, then we can't, we can't build the youth ministry. If I don't give, we can't, we can't build a children's ministry. If I, if I don't, then God won't. And, and, and the problem with this got to give mentality is that the people do give, but they give out of guilt. They, they give out of, you know, man, yeah, if I, if I, if, man, if you guys, guys, come on, if you don't give, then we, we're going to, we, we're not going to have any heat for the winter. The church is going to freeze up if you don't give. Like, and so people will give out of pity and they give out of, uh, and, they get, and they give to, to, to fix a problem. But the problem with this is that, one, it's not, it's not usually out of the right heart. And, and, and secondly, it's, it's rarely consistent. And, and the, the motive is wrong. It, we shouldn't give so that, so that we can fix something. We give out of obedience t to God. Amen? And so, so you know, God doesn't need our, our money we're, because we're going to do... All those things anyway. Can I tell you, 
when, when, we, when I first came here and we, if you've been here long enough to, to remember, and we redid the lobby and we turned those coat closets into a coffee bar and into a welcome center and, and we painted the church and we put some, just started doing some capital improvement. We didn't have any money. We had no money. None. Zero. It was running in the red. But, but as the Lord was moving on us to, to make some steps forward, we just, my board said, you know what? We just got to trust God that it's going to happen. And before I knew it, st- st- uh, money's just started, started coming in. And, and, and I wasn't up here begging for it. And then when we got to when we, where we needed a youth pastor, and we hired our first youth pastor. His name was Pastor Paul Cortez. Some of you might remember Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul came to us, and I told Paul, I said, I have no promises. I can't promise I can pay you anything. But I need you to come and commit for a year. Because the church had not only lost their senior pastor, they lost their youth pastor. And so Pastor Paul came in faith. We stepped out in faith and we hired him. We had no money. You know what? Somebody, not even from our church, but from outside our church, the Lord spoke to them. They called me up. They said, Pastor, uh, the Lord has spoken to me about your youth pastor. And we want to support your youth pastor for a week, on a weekly stipend. And so we're going to start sending checks. Do you have a youth pastor? You know, I just hired a guy. And for one year, they made a commitment to pay, and they never missed a payment. Every single week, they, they wrote a check every week, and he was provided for that whole year. And God, and God provided. When we brought on Pastor JC, we had no money. We did not have any money to bring on a, a, another staff member, but we stepped out in faith. And you know what? From the day he came, he's never had to hold a check. He's never had to, he's never, we never had to withdraw any, or, or, to, or to hold back finances or anything. He, in fact, we've given him two or three raises over, over the course of his time here with us. The, in other words, the point that I'm making is every time we've stepped forward, it wasn't because we were flowing in an abundance. It's because God said, listen, you just be faithful with the little that I put in your hand and you invest that into my kingdom and see if I will not open up the floodgates of heaven. And now church, I'm telling you, we are, we are, we, we are, I mean, we'll, we'll be close to 400 people today. And I'm not, that's not a, hey, hey, hurrah, hurrah. That is, that is just like, see what God has done. And God continues to bless and God continues to, to pour out his blessing uh, upon this church because we are faithful. Not, we don't give because we, we have to. We give because we get to. Amen? And so God is telling us, listen, I'm not looking for your sacrifice. He's not looking for you to sacrifice so we can fix the boiler. He, he's not, he's all, and this is the reason. God has already sacrificed everything that needs to be sacrificed. Everything that needs to be sacrificed has been sacrificed. He's not looking for your sacrifice. He's looking for your obedience. Amen? And in fact, 1 Samuel 15 says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. That's scripture. And so he said, listen, don't, don't tip me. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse. Cornerstone, God is not, an, a, a need, not in a need situation. He, his ability to move on this church, to, to touch people's lives, to bless you, to create to heal, to release, to deliver. It is not limited by our giving. Amen for that. And so God, you know, God owns it all. And so, you know, I heard uh, this is something that you can take to the bank and you can deposit it today. Here's in here. And I want you to really chew on this, that God is not in a desperate need of what you have to give him. We are in a desperate need of what he has to give us. God is not in a desperate... Man, pastor, that is good. Pre- you should say that again, pastor. I, I think I will. God is not in a desperate need of what we have to give him. We are in a desperate need of what he has to give us. Amen. And, and he says, he says, test me in this. Test me. Try it out. Take it for a test drive. Try it for 60 days. See if I'm lying. Not a God that I should lie. Test me. See, Cornerstone, I don't have to, to, to give uh, I, don't, I don't have to give. I, don't, I, I, I get to give. I don't have to give so that I can, I can have. I give because I get to. It's a, it, I'm redeeming the tithe. The second false approach is I give to get. I give to get. And some people have this mentality. And I, and I just, I'm just, honestly, I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry that there are so many false teachers and preachers out there with big platforms that are, that are spewing this kind of garbage over our airwaves because it is garbage. And they, because they, they preach that you can somehow divinely twist the arm of God and force him into a hundredfold blessing. It is, I, I want to tell you, that kind of teaching is reckless. 
it's irresponsible, it's, it's ungodly, frankly, it's heresy. It's not true. You can't, you can't force God to bless you. They, God is already blessing you. It's our job to get into, in line with him, to follow in his path. See, there's no need for you to give to get. And the reason why is because he's already given. And for most of you, you've already gotten. And you say, well, I would like to see that in, in Scripture, Pastor. And I am so glad you asked because I'm going to show you. John chapter 3, verse 16. Ever heard of it? For God so loved the world that he gave. gave. He what? Gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have. have. He gave. so that we can have. He gave. so we can have everlasting life. Amen. He gave so we can have. I don't have to give so that I can get. I've, he's already given everything there is to give so that I can have. And now listen, how many of you like to give good gifts to your children? How many kids here like to get good gifts from your parents? Amen. <laughs> but imagine if your kid comes to you and it's Christmas time and you say, hey, mom, dad, I want to, you know, honey, what would you like for Christmas? And they say, well, mommy, I would like everlasting life. How many could deliver on that? You, you can't deliver on everlasting life. God is the provider of everlasting life. You know, I've never, and it doesn't even stop there. That's how gracious our God is. Not only has he forgiven you of your sin and purified you of all unrighteousness, he's clothed you in his son's righteousness. He no longer sees you as sinner, but as righteous. It gives you an, a, a passport into heaven so that when he sees you, he sees you not as sinner, but as redeemed because he's exchanged your sin for something better. Amen. He's, he's, he's redeemed something from loss and, and he ushers you into heaven. He says, well, done thou good and faithful servant now enter in what are you entering into well the bible says that he's gone to prepare a place for me and in that place he says he says in my house there are many mansions Amen. well there's one with chris's name on it hallelujah. hallelujah is right and guess what it's heaven so you don't ever even have to clean it <laughs> i can't wait it's gonna be amazing god's got a, a mansion just over the hilltop we used to sing amen and, he's, and so he's got a mansion awaiting me in heaven. And when I get to heaven, this is how great things are. This is what he has for us. He says, he says you're going to enter through pearly gates. I've never even preached on heaven here before. But I will tell you, in my study of heaven, they, the, the Bible teaches about those gates, those pearly gates. That one gate is made from a single pearl. A single, that's a massive pearl. Amen? That's one big oyster. And he, and, he, and he makes a single pearl into a gate and that the streets are laden with gold, which, which should tell you how much value God has for, for our monetary system here on earth. He, he, he paves his streets with gold. It's under our feet. Amen. That's how, I mean, when, when, when what we hold is some of the highest value here on earth is under your feet. In other words, your ceiling on earth is the floor in heaven. Hallelujah. That's how great it's going to be in light of his glory. He says that there's a sea that is made of crystal. It's going to be an amazing, amazing place. And you have life there everlasting, everlasting. It's going to be awesome. And, and, then, and then I read, uh, because I'm in a Bible reading plan, and I read just a, the other day, Proverbs chapter 3. And oh, man, I about came out of my chair. I was so excited when I was reading this. And you're going to get excited too. In fact, we're going to have a Holy Ghost hoedown right here in just a minute. Because listen to this. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, talking about how much he's given us and how much is available to us and that we don't have to give so that we can get, but he's already given so that we can have. But watch this. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with what? All. All of it. All your heart. And lean not on your own understandings and in all your ways. How many ways? All of them. How much of the tithe? All of it. He's saying, listen, all of your heart, submit all of your ways to him and he will make your path straight. He goes on. He says, listen, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Shun evil. This will bring health to your body. How many of you value health? 
Amen. He said, if you value health, here's a recipe for health. Right here in God's words. Turn, turn from your wicked ways. Trust in the Lord with everything. Submit unto him, and he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Shun evil. That brings health to your life. Then he goes on. He says, fear the Lord. Shun, uh, that, that's, that's going back. I'm going forward. And he says, and nourishment to your bones. Verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth. In other words, he's put it in your hands. Now honor him with it. And he says this, and with the first fruits of all your crops, in other words, don't tip me, you bring me the full tithe. And then, and then watch this, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with wine. Sounds real familiar to a scripture I read in Malachi, amen? Your, 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 your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those that he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Verse 13. Blessed are those who find wisdom. Those who, did you hear that? Yes. Wisdom. Wisdom. Remember we talked about, we've been talking about wisdom for the last three weeks that we should be, forget it's New Year's resolutions. How many have blown your New Year's resolutions already? We're three weeks in. Be honest. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. You already blew your three. You throw, throw the New Year's resolutions out the window. Don't worry about that. You face wisdom. Go after wisdom. And he says, blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing, nothing, nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways and all her paths are peace. How many value peace? Amen. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, to those who hold her fast will be blessed. Amen. Woo! That is awesome. So when I think about a life everlasting and I think about peace and I think about health and I think about wellness and I think about, and I think about the hope that I have and I think about the fullness that the scripture in one passage of scripture, God has just given me the whole blessing of everything that I could ever hope for in this world and in the world to come. Amen. You don't have to give to get. He already gave so that you can have. You, he already gave so that you can have. Which brings me to the appropriate approach to giving. And that is, I get to give approach. That's the I get to give approach. You don't have to give. You don't give to get. We get to give. And guess what? I want to tell you something. Even if you don't give, it's not going to send you to hell. I'm not going to stand up here and say, will a man rob God? I will send you to hell. That's not true. That nowhere in the Bible does it say that tithing is necessary for you to go to heaven. It does not say that. It says that you are saved by grace Amen. through your faith in Jesus Christ. That's his gift to you. So God's not in heaven waiting for you to pay up. It's not, it's not like that. Lightning's not going to fall down and strike you. And if you don't give, I'm not sending Big Joe to your house to shake you down. <laughs> I'm not monitoring. Listen, the truth is, and, I, and I, I didn't say this in the first two services, but I don't even know what anybody gives in this church. I, it's not, the, reason, the reason that I, that I don't keep track of it as the pastor, and, and I have some pastor friends that they monitor every person's giving and they know exactly what they give. I don't do that. And the reason I don't do that is because I don't want to look at anybody any different than anybody else. We, we are all equal at the cross, amen? And just in, and because, because one person's giving status is higher than the other doesn't mean that I should ever value them more than anybody else in the church. So I purposely don't do that. We have, we have a, a, a crackerjack bookkeeper. We have a responsible treasurer. We have a very healthy board. We have people who take care of that for, for me, I guess, or for the church. And, and so I don't monitor all that. Now, some people think that that's irresponsible, but I think it's just good pastoring. That's just, that's just my heart, okay? And so, and so, and so we're, we're not going to kick you out of the church. We're not waiting at the door. We're not shunning you. We're not praying evil curses over you. Nothing like that is happening. I'm not trying to give you an out, though. I'm not trying to give you an excuse. I'm just trying to let you know that the reason that I'm preaching this message is not because the church needs your money. 
And it's not because God needs your money. The reason that I'm preaching this message is the same reason that God gave the message to Malachi to the people of Israel. Because in many cases, you back yourself up into a curse and you don't even realize it. And God wants God wants you to come back to him. And if you will, he will come back to you. It's a message of redemption. It's saying, redeem the tithe today. Redeem the tithe today. Do you know why we even get in the first place? The, we, the reason that we receive in the first place is so that we can give. In other words, um, Genesis chapter 12, Abraham, the Bible says, Ab- uh, God was speaking to Abraham and he says, you, uh, you will receive blessing and all the nations will be blessed through you. In other words, I'm going to pour into you and as I pour into you, you're going to pour into others. Because Abraham had proved that he would be responsible with what God put in his hand. You see, God is, God is not, God wants to use you as, as not just a recipient of his blessings. He wants to use you as a conduit of his blessings. He wants you to be blessed so that you can bless. And so, and so because see today he might say, I want you, you know, I, I want you to, to give in your tithe because I want to bless you. Tomorrow he might say, I, I, I want you to donate your car to such and such. And we laugh at that, but it's the truth. Do you know, in my ministerial experience, I have received not one, not two, but three cars. People have just given me. They weren't junk. They ran for a long time. And, and no strings attached. Just, you know what? I had one person, I've shared this story before. I had one person while I was in college, they called me up at midnight. Uh, Chris, we were in prayer. The Holy Spirit spoke to us, said, the next time you're in Oklahoma, we need to give you our truck. When's the next time you're coming to Oklahoma? I said, Tomorrow. <laughs> and I did. I said before before they had a chance to change their mind, I got myself there. I, I went in a three-cylinder Geo Metro. Remember the Geo Metros? And there was like four of us packing this thing, like Wah! all the way, all the way to Oklahoma. We got there and I Dodge Ram charge. That was a nice truck, man. Got six miles to the gallon. That thing is a beast. I was like, thank you for the gift. I can't afford to drive it, but thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I wish I had it today. You know what those things are trading for now? Like $25,000. People want for 81 Dodge Ram Chargers. Crazy. I know because my daughter's turning 16 and her she, she, she likes these pickups, like these 70s and 80 model pickups. And everywhere you look, they're like 30 grand. I'm like, they're 30 years old. How come there's so much money? I don't know. Don't build them like they used to. I'm not really setting up for a great altar call, am I? Okay. But we, but we redeem the tithe. We redeem the tithe. So, so, so the, the, the problem for mankind is that this type of, of hilarious giving, is, it's a kingdom principle. It's a kingdom principle. And our natural response is to believe that God is prying our fingers free of our, of our money. And, 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 you know, Winston Churchill said this. He says, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So when you redeem the tithe, you're activating God's promises in your life. And it makes you a cheerful giver. It makes you a cheerful, not, not grumbling. Oh, my God, I got to sign that paper. I'm a member of the church. I got to get that's, that's a grumbling giver. That's still, that's still backing yourself up into a curse. The Bible says, I love a cheerful giver. And when you learn to give and to give and to give. And listen, it's not about the amount. It's not about the amount. When it comes to the tithe, he says, bring me the whole tithe. You remember the Pharisees, when Jesus was lounging with the disciples and they were at the temple courts and they, they were giving, they were coming and giving their alms and their, and their offerings. And the Pharisees were walking around. They're like, whoo, look at, and they get like fanning out their cash. Like, you know, look at me with all my cash. And they, and they were, they were just making a big production about how much they were giving and they were giving a lot. And, uh, and, you know, they're dropping the keys to the Lambo in there, and they're dropping, you know, and, they're, and uh, you know, and, and they're just making a big deal about it. And there was this widow that came by, this poor widow, and she had, no, she had two mites in her hand. And, 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 she, and she walks up and she places, she places it's, it, it amounted to half a cent. She puts it into, into the offering, and it drove Jesus to his feet. Two times in scripture do we see Jesus stand to his feet. Once was with the widow's might. The other time was when Stephen was uh, martyred and, and, and he, Jesus was in his resurrected state and he stood 
and out of respect. He was seated at the right hand of the Father, and he stood for Stephen. And, and this, this widow, this widow gives, and, and it was nothing. It, it amounted to nothing. But Jesus stands to his feet, and the Bible says that he was excited, and he says to the disciples, did you see? Did you see what she gave? And they're like, yeah, she, she gave a, a mite. And he said, no, she gave all that she had. She gave everything that she, that she had. And, and that's what God, he wants our hearts to be so hungry, so desperate from him that, that none, of it, none of it really matters. If God, whatever God says to do, we do, not because we have to, not because we get something in return, but because we have the privilege of participating in kingdom work. And when God is, calls on us to, to give and to, and, to be, uh, and to be a conduit of blessing, our answer is just simply yes, because he's put it all in our hands anyway. Redeem the tithe redeem the tithe. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. I'm not, I'm not up here, try, I hope, I hope that I've made myself very clear. I'm not trying to guilt anybody. I, I Really. That's why I put that whole thing in there about how if you, if you choose to walk away from this message and you don't ever uh, participate in the tithe for the rest of the time that you call Cornerstone your home, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not shaking you down. It's not about that. What, I, what my purpose in this is today is to release inside of you the blessings of heaven. And for you to, to maybe you're under a curse and you don't even know it, but, but as you operate in obedience to the tithe, then God does something amazing inside of your life. And, 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 and the coolest thing in this whole passage of scripture, I think, is that God says, test me in this test me in this and see and so here's here's what I want to challenge you to do maybe you're not a regular tither maybe you have a hard time with it and listen that's that's not a foreign concept it's it's kind of normal when you're especially if you're new in the Lord to kind of be like really a tenth of my income that's that's asking a lot pastor it's not your income it's the Lord's but that, but we've been down that road and, and I've talked with many, many people, but here at the bottom line, he says, test me in this. So I'm going to say, put him to the test. Put him to the test. And here's how you can do it. Do your part. Commit for three months. Say, all right, Lord, I'm going to give to the tithe cheerfully, not grumbling, not complaining. I am going in with a heart of expectation. And for three months, I'm going to be faithful to tithe. And, and do. And don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything detour you because the enemy will come against you. He will fight you. He will. But you, and for three, for 12 weeks, three months, you just, you give faithfully to the tithe. And I just challenge you to see, to see what God, you know, I have, I, I know, I know a pastor who uh, puts his church to a, a tithing test and he challenges them for one year. He says, but here's the caveat. He says, he says, if you, if you give faithfully in the tithe for one year and after a year, God has not done anything to bless you in your life. We will refund you 100% of your tithe. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. But three months, I'm, I'm challenging you, three months, and see, just see. Because you know what? I, listen, I, because I have 100% confidence that, that God will so open up the floodgates of heaven in your life and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room to, to store it. That's what the Bible says. So either, either this is the truth or it's not. And when God gives us permission to test him, then he's pretty serious about it. And so, and so I want to pastor a church that is so full of cheerful givers, not just to the church, but in anything that God is moving on your heart to do. God, God may move on your heart to, 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 to bless somebody outside of this church. That's fine. But be faithful to the tithe. Be faithful to the tithe. Church at Cornerstone, we are, we are in, a, in, a, in a very solid cash flow positive place as a church. We ended this year well into the black and we give God honestly give God all the praise for that amen and we have we have a business meeting coming up in February and if you're a member of the church you need to be here and you'll see all those numbers and, and all that but uh, but can, so so it's not it's not a matter of need the cash it's not it's not like that it's it's are you obedient to his decrees and if you are, then redeem, the, redeem that tithe. Exchange the tithe for something greater. Because God's got more for you than finances. He, he wants to bless you in, 
in so many amazing ways. And God wants to unlock things in this church. But sometimes we are limited because we're, we're surrounded by a curse and we don't even realize we're in it. So take him to the test. Put him to the test. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray for you. And we're going to go, Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I do, Lord. And I thank you, Father, for your promises. I thank you, Father, that you are such a caring God, that you, you so desperately want fellowship with us, that you said, if, you'll, if you will come to me, I will, if you will return to me, I will return to you. Lord, that you're just looking for us to make that faith step, to, to, be, to be faithful in what you've entrusted in our hands, to steward properly what you've given us, Lord. And God, that, that as you give us little and we're responsible with little, then you give us more to be responsible with. And so, Lord, I just pray, Father, for every man, woman, every teenager that's here, Lord, everybody who manages any measure of finance, I pray, God, that each of us will be faithful to the tithe. Lord, the, the 10%, the one-tenth. And, Lord, that we would honor you, God, with cheerful giving. And, God, that you will throw open the floodgates of heaven. And, Lord, that you will so bless them, Father, that they will that they will, will not have room to contain all that you want to do in their life. Whether that's in health or in connections or network or, or, or whether it's in, in business acumen or, or whether it's in their education and their, uh, their, their intelligence or their, their memory recall or, uh, Lord, whether it's in uh, their ministries and in, in their ministry gifts and the effectiveness, Lord, their prayers. And, Lord, I, whatever it is, Father, I pray, God, that you would throw open the floodgates of heaven wide, Father, so that they can receive all that you have for them. I pray, God, that as we leave this place, that we leave rejoicing today, God, with exceeding great joy, because we are a people who are learning to redeem the time and to redeem the tithe. And so, Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you all. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next week. God bless you.